We are very happy to welcome you uh, today to this webinar on equity and market data. This session is part of a new series of educational seminars that are designed to give you an overview of the various parts of the financial industry and the regulatory uh, landscape. A second webinar on derivatives and CCPs will take place next Thursday, 9 December. So the uh, webinar today will be presented by our five speakers, uh, Pierre uh, Bertrand Bia, Equity Product Manager at Euronext and Professor of Finance at the Université Paris II, Panthéon Assas, Sylvia Bosoni, F of uh, ETFs, ETPs and Open End Funds, Listing and Market Development at Euronext, Anders Green, Associate Vice President, Product Development at NASDAQ Nordic Markets, Shelly Orr, Head of Commercial Management Market Data at Euronext, and Daphne van der Stam, Director of Government Affairs Europe at Euronext. I will uh, kindly ask the participant to please uh, mute yourself and close the video uh, if you are not the speaker. There will be a Q&A session at the end, but please feel free to interact with the speakers uh, during the, the session. You can either write your question via the chat or use the small icon which is on top of the screen to raise your hand so that the speaker can see you and, um, and, and ask you to intervene. Please also note that we are recording uh, this, uh, this session. So before uh, getting into uh, the details of the webinar, let me very quickly introduce phases. So we represent 36 exchanges in equity, bonds and derivatives, as well as 13 uh, MTFs. So to give you an idea of uh, the size of European financial markets, we have included here a couple of key figures which provide us with an overview of why these are important uh, in supporting uh, European growth. We have also included a couple of slides uh, highlighting some of the key facts about exchanges and as well to clarify the difference between uh, equity and derivatives markets. So no worries if now I'm going quickly through them now because we will share the slides after the, the webinar. Today uh, we will focus on equity trading, how it works and how it's regulated, uh, the role of market data in equity trading, and we will also provide an overview of the different consolidated tape options. We will as well discuss ETFs trading, its evolution and characteristics. So we believe this, uh, this session is very timely because we are now starting the review of some of the rules applicable to these markets. So we really hope with this session to help you clarify a few of these key uh, concept. Briefly on the index, the session, as I say, will, will start with equity trading, then moving on to market data and consolidated tape, ETFs, the regulatory framework, and as I said earlier, it, we will have a, a short Q&A session uh, at the end. So I will not go now in, into further details as uh, our speakers are eager to start. So Anders, uh, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Good? Yeah. Perfect. So I think a couple of introductions could be quite handy. So in this section, myself and, and my colleague at Euronext PR will, will give you some more insights into equity trading. But if I just start to present myself uh, on the screen, uh, I have a 30 plus actually experience from the industry worked at the regulator, worked as a trader, worked with post trade at the CSD, and now since more than 10 years, almost 15 years, working for Nasdaq Nordic in equity trading. So what are my main interests? Well, micro market structure, details, all the mechanics. It's like working in the engine room of the exchange with all the nuts and bolts that is my main interest and on top of that uh, i'm quite interested in high frequency trading and uh, low latency trading so that's a little bit about me maybe yeah you could could say a few words yes sure thank you very much and but maybe uh yeah oh, fine I, I wanted to do it while presenting my my part directly but yeah for for those of you who don't know me my name is pierre bertrand Diaz, and i am in charge part of the equity trading product development at Euronex, and i will be speaking about uh, market fragmentation and liquidity perfect perfect so if we start by just 
setting the scene a little bit with with a few central concepts. Uh, what is traded? Who is trading? How is it traded? So, so when we talk about equity, what do we mean then? I mean, typically we we talk about a part, an ownership of a company, and that that is typically represented by you have a number of share certificates, shares, or stocks. In my world, I, I use shares and stocks interchangeable, so I use both those two two words. In the area of equities, I also uh, think of depositor receipts, various rights that are derived from equity tra trading in corporate actions. So that's a little bit about the equity. Uh, we in this slide we talk a little bit about price, price setting the price and price formation, and we'll come back a little bit on that later in this deck. But it's not the exchange setting the price; it's actually the market and the participants in multilateral trading that, based on expectations of many investors, are setting the correct price of the stock. But we'll come back a little bit on price formation later in this presentation. When it comes to trading, uh, exchanges typically organize trading into lists or segments or other classifications. And maybe you have heard about small cap, mid cap, large cap, etc. You certainly have heard about index stocks. So index stocks are typically the most traded stocks on the primary exchange. And for example, I work for Nasdaq in Stockholm. So we have one index called OMXS30, the 30 most traded stocks. And the index is quite important. I mean, it's a basket of stocks. There's an index created. It's very used for performance measures. It's used as underlying for ETPs, which we will hear more about later. It's it's used for various, various uh, equity derivatives, et cetera. So index or blue ship shares that's a key concept, uh, actually. So, who is actually trading? Well, I was thinking a little bit about that, and, and I would actually argue that everyone is trading. Uh, maybe not directly, but you have your pension in the, in the pension, pension company, and they trade on behalf of you. So everyone in Europe is actually trading in some way. But the typical way we think about trading is that a trading exchange, an exchange has members, banks and brokers, and we as retail private persons, we leave the orders, the instructions to the broker and the broker trades on behalf of us. That is a little bit the high level thing. We'll come back a little bit about on the concepts later. How is equity traded? Well, I think we, we, we since we are uh, two exchange representatives, I think we 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 surely want to say that exchanges organizes trading in a, in a fairly uh, safe and, and good way. We have trading systems, electronic trading system, where we cap capture order buy and sell instructions from members, and we use the trading systems to create trades uh, that is then published uh, publicly. So. We will go through the details on, 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 on how buy and sell orders actually interact. But uh, with this, I just wanted to say that exchanges are crucial. On this slide, there, there are some, some, uh, some uh, more details, but I think unless, Pierre, you have anything to add on this slide, uh, we can go to the next. Sure. Uh, I suggest we move on directly to yeah, to, to page 11, um, that's perfect. Here, uh, well, I thank you Anders and thank you very much again to Fede for, for inviting me. Here on page 11 and 12, I'm going to spend some time talking about equity market fragmentation. Since this is a very important topic, if we want to understand the key concept of liquidity that will be coming again and again uh, within this presentation. So as you may already know, trading environments have evolved considerably, mostly thanks to innovation in information technology, of course. And since evolving regulation, MIFID 1, MIFID 2, have lowered barriers to entry and contributed to the growth of multiple trading venues. 
Whilst market fragmentation is not a new phenomenon, um, what has changed recently is its importance and as market and alternative places are increasingly facilitating execution of order through different trading platforms and of course channel. And this is what this pie chart is about. Here we can highlight the fragmentation in European, in a, sorry, European equity trading since January 2021 outside of large in scale and looking at regular hours only. Put it in another way, this shows that how the trading volumes are split between uh, or across several channels of execution between regulated markets, multilateral trading facility, systematic and analyzers, and pure OTC over the counter. Whereas regulated markets, primary venues and MTF are usually offering multilateral trading of stocks across lead continuous and auction trading phase. You may know that SIs are distinguishing themselves by offering alternative execution based on bilateral trading and not multilateral, like I said before, and are usually run either by a bank or a liquidity provider uh, trading against its own capital. Looking at the figure, you can easily understand that there is a very, very fierce competition between MTF and lead exchanges in order to attract as much liquidity as possible in their order book. Now, moving on to the next page, uh, so page 12, if we, if I'm doing it, yes, here we go, perfect. Uh, moving on to the next page, so here we can stress how the, the competition has evolved since 2018, which was the start of the implementation of MIFID 2 between MTF and primaries, and looking at three execution channels, lead, auction, and dark. And let's highlight something very important here. Uh, you see that during most of 2020, primaries seen a significant increase of their share of trading versus MTF, moving from an average of 60-40% to 70-30% during the peak of the COVID-19 crisis. And since Q2 2021, you see that we are now back to pre-COVID levels, more or less. Well, we believe that there is a reason behind that. Basically, when volatility strikes, we can expect brokers and banks being more keen to trade in the lit uh, in the primaries exchange, rather than using the lead or the dark order book of our competitors, the MTF. And we believe that this is due to liquidity, rapidly, rapidity sorry, of execution, and of course the quality of the order book. Market quality metrics can cover a lot of things, for instance, being a setter more than 60% of the time in the European best bid and offer, and or showcasing a better spread at touch in the first limit. Now, one last point on these slides uh, that will be enhanced at a later stage by, by Anders. Uh, it's the growing importance of the auction session. Uh, with there are several types of auction, uh, periodics or opening, the most important one remains the closing auction, since this concentrates uh, basically in the last five minutes of the day between 20 to 40% of the overall traded volume uh, depending on the primary market of reference, meaning that this is key to find deep pools of liquidity for the benefit of the end users. Well, I could speak hours about equity market fragmentation, but I believe that now Anders will uh, take over and continue to explain price formation and, and trading mechanism. Uh, so. Yeah, thanks a lot, Pierre, and everything is just all fit together. So we'll circle back a little bit about you know, maybe a little bit of fundamentals here, but how are prices formed on exchanges? And this is an important topic, you know, price discovery, price formation processes. How is that actually working? And these are central concepts. I mean, we have investors out there doing their information gathering. They need to understand the prices. They need to understand the current state of the market. They need to see the previous trades in the stock that they are interested in. They want to be informed. They want to place the buy and the sell order on the market. That order may trade, lead to this trade that is published in real time to all other you know, participants and investors. So it's it's a very important process with many actors and that is one thing that we as at least primary exchanges are quite quite keen on to point that multilateral trading many to many many participants trade with each other 
And these participants have various client groups like retail, like uh, buy side institutions, pension funds. It's all in the, the mix creating the price. And in, in this game, transparency is important. What, what do we mean by transparency? Well, we talk about two things. It's about orders that are transparent. We talk about pre-trade transparency. I, as a trader, if you want to put in an order, I mean, as a retail person, you want to understand the market. You want to see where the, where the, order, where the best buy orders and the best seller orders are priced. You want to see the last traded price. You want to do that in, in real time. Otherwise, you cannot put in your order if you don't have that information. So looking at the orders in real time, how it looks, the order book. We'll come back, by the way, on the order book concept is pre-trade transparency. Post-trade transparency is, is when the trade has happened. We need to publish as, as an exchange the trade in real time directly, available for all at the same time. And this transparency leads to informed decisions by many investors. I mean, obviously, there are more sophisticated investors, and we'll discuss that later, and, and less sophisticated perhaps retail clients, but all should have equal access to the information. And that is actually something that we as primary exchanges are extremely concerned and think it's very important that we provide fair and orderly markets, equal access for everyone. Everything is equal. I mean, there's no, you cannot pay yourself to get the faster track into the exchange. It's equal for everyone. Transparent prices, transparent rules, surveillance on the trades that are happening to you know uh, see if there is some kind of market manipulation because if it's market manipulation that destroys the price discovery process obviously if there are people that are trying to affect the prices by putting in orders that are not supposed to trade for example so this leads to, I mean, if we have this, this fair and orderly markets, it leads to trust, trust in pricing. Trust in pricing leads to lower cost of capital raise for the companies. I mean, if, if there's a big uncertainty where the price is, how can the company raise capital in an effective way? And this is, of course, very important for the economic growth in Europe and especially the growing companies, you know, the guys seeking capital to do the IPOs. If it's unsure about where the prices should be, uh, they will get less for their, their shares in the IPO. So it's extremely important that this, this, this whole play works <laughs> in a very effective and safe way. And that's why we are here, primary exchanges. And, we have the alternative um, of the lateral trading facilities, which Pierre re reflected to. I will come back to that a little bit later. On this slide, we discuss a little bit about market data and trading. And I mean, I, I just say that trading without market data is not possible. Market data will not happen without trading. So it sort of goes hand in hand. I mean, you cannot place an order unless you know the market where the market is, you know. A lot of words on this slide, but I think price discovery and the uh, integrity of the market are key key points for 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 this market. Pierre, anything to add? Sorry, not not on that one. Let's move on. Okay, so trading mechanism. We'll start discussing a little bit about transactions, how they happen, supply and demand, but I, I, I just wanted to do it more simple. I just want to talk about demand and supply. I mean, if we just talk about buyers, I mean, if you want to buy an equity, buy a stock, buy a share, you want to buy as cheap as possible, right? And the cheaper the prices, I mean, you can allocate more volume, more shares. So you're definitely very interested to buy a premium company at a uh, pretty low price. And then it's the same thing with the sellers. I mean, you want to sell as expensive as possible, but if the price is super high, I mean, there will be a lot of sellers. So this is a classical, you know, supply and demand. 
but I mean, this leads to some very, very, very central concepts in, in equities trading. I mean, if you have this, the buyers and the sellers, and obviously there are just a few buyers at the top by price levels and many buyers on, on you know, very low prices. But I mean, if you look at the, the best buy price or best bid price, I use these bid or buy, you know, I just mix them all the time. And you look at the, the best sell price or ask or offer offer. We actually constitute something that is called the spread. So, for example, if we have the buyers or I mean, if we have a stock with the, that has a spread of 100 versus 102, what does that mean? Well, the buyers are buying at 100. The sellers are selling at 102 and the spread is two euros. So very important concept, best buy or best bid, best sell, best ask, and spread. And when, happen, when does a trade happen? I mean, if, if the buyers are buying at 100, the sellers are selling at 102, nothing will happen, right? Well, sometimes people are jumping over the spread, like, well, I'm a buyer. Eh. Let's buy at 102. I cross the spread and, and create a trade at 102. So that is the concept of demand and supply and the spread and how a trade is is done. Maybe maybe here and just may, may I start? I think there is a very important yes. concept that's, that's highlighted uh, for all the, the people that are watching us. You see that a large majority of the transaction mechanism is run electronically. Uh, and and to that extent, you know, when we talk to some of our members, we need to to have in mind that for some of the trading desks in Europe, more than 98% of their transactions are actually being made by algorithm, so what we call trading by algos, and only 2% are made directly, you know, by uh, by uh, I would say manual uh, intervention, and this is what we call the difference between high and low touch in our in our fields. That's very good, Pierre. Uh, those concepts are very important as well. I'll go to the next slide. Uh, Pierre, you you actually presented this 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 uh, topic very well. Uh, auctions, and actually this is this is my favorite. I like trading, and and auction trading is my favorite actually. And there are some some concepts in auction trading, and I will try to go through those concepts uh, in, 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 in step by step here. So auctions is something that happens during a period. So we have a period of five or 10 minutes where orders are collected from many participants, investors, gather all together. During this, this period, the exchanges matching algorithms or auction algorithms are calculating, okay, at what price can we execute the most shares at this very moment? And we publish that in real time. So, we, Pierre, you talked about the closing auction, 20 to 40 percent of, of uh, trading, uh, automatic trading, a huge liquidity event. During those five minutes, exchange are publishing the equilibrium price, we call it, the, the proposed clearing price, and uh, the volume that can be traded. And then at the very last 30 seconds of the closing auction, we just randomly pick a moment to uncross the book, meaning that we execute the trades at one single clearing price. So everyone will get the same price. It's equal for all. A huge pool of liquidity changing buyers, sellers, sellers to buyers, I mean, and everyone is equally treated. And this is actually something that has grown during the past years, as, as Pierre mentioned. The, and that was the closing auction. And Pierre, you mentioned the opening auction, very important as well. That is, well, maybe not 20 to 40 percent, maybe one to two percent, something like that is traded in the opening. But the opening sets the starting price of the equity. And the, 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 the opening auction is, 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 is between five to 10 minutes, but it has the same mechanics. Gather a lot of orders from participants, multilateral. Multilateral means that 
many participants participate formulating the price. So this has to be the correct price. If you go elsewhere and trade bilateral with someone, how do you guarantee that you get the correct price? This, this is the correct price. The opening price is the correct price. The closing auction price is the correct price. On this slide, we, we talk a little bit about some other auctions like volatility halt auctions. Sub, sometimes shares are a little bit too volatile and exchanges stop trading them for a minute or two or three. And we run a classical auction to find a new clearing price and starting point for continuous trading again. And then, uh, yeah, I think you mentioned that, I mean, we have the fragmentation into dark pools and frequent batch auctions. I, I, it has been quite significant. And, and uh, alongside the dark pools, frequent batch auctions, which is like a derivative, derivative of a dark pool, uh, has grown quite significant the, the past years. And those frequent batch auctions typically have a very short auctions, typically less than a millisecond. So very, very short and frequent auctions happening based on orders that are being crossed, crossed in the specific order book. I mean, uh, uh, some primary exchanges provide frequent batch auctions. We do that, but not everyone has, has, has taken on this, 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 this trading mechanism. Yeah, anything to add? You say, you say it all, no reason. Perfect. Okay, so this is a little bit circling back to the beginning in, in some way. So what made this, this the, the market look like it, it looks today? And uh, here we have a, a few words, the materialization and information network. I just wanted to start with the his, historically, I mean, if you traded shares like 40, 50 years ago, then as a buyer, you would get, you know, share certificates in paper and you, you had to give, you know, money in the hand. Right? If, if you bought, you had to, to pay the seller, right? So very physical. And uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, the uh, dematerialization came along, meaning that the share certificates, the shares become electronic. And who is managing that? That's where this the CSD, the Central Securities Depositories, comes in and provides services to keep the share register for companies listed, but also manage settlement. And settlement is another important word. Settlement means that when uh, you have bought something, you would like to have the share, right? And you need to pay. So that is something organized by central de securities depositories the uh, settlement delivery versus payment is, is a word that frequently com comes up uh, the past 10 15 years i would say that the role of ccps has become more important uh, previously every trade was sort of settled i mean if i if I bought and sold, bought and sold during the day, every single trade would be settled and, and the shares and, and money would be exchanged for every single trade. But I know that there will be a separate uh, training about CCPs, but the CCP, in short words, is someone stepping in between the buyer and seller and takes on the responsibility. So that is something that is now more, I would say, the common way to 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 trade to trade uh, stocks and equities in in Europe. Okay, information network. What is that? I just wanted to say that all exchanges are having their infrastructure somewhere, and where is that? I mean, in data centers. So most exchanges provide their services out of well-known and recognized data centers in London. Bergamo, Stockholm, wherever in Europe, you know, and those data centers have standard access, fiber access, and something that has been been coming along the, the past years is actually uh, radio frequency or microwaves. So that is the the most fastest way to communicate to data centers if you're located uh, in the far distance is actually to use microwaves 
there are a few more race links set up in Europe, across Europe. Okay. Yeah, here, if I may add something, what, what basically yeah. I'll just try to describe, it's what we call in our jargon, if I may say, it means it's latency. Basically, here it's very important because the latency means the, 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 the percentage, for the, the time in, in microseconds, milliseconds between when the order has been sent from the trader basically in London to when it's going to reach the data center for Euronext, it's going to be in Bergamo, as some of you may be aware. Um, this latency of time might take up to a certain point. And basically, uh, traders and brokers and high frequency trading firms are looking at it in a very important way because this means uh, uh, arriving to the order book. Uh, in, uh, in there is always a race to be the, the most, uh, the fattest, uh, the fattest person uh, in order to arrive to, to the order book. So latency is very, very important. Th thanks a lot. And I mean, Bergamo and perhaps the, the, the firms are sitting in London or in Amsterdam or in Stockholm. It's the same for, for NASDAQ. We have the data center in Stockholm. The competitors are having their infrastructure in London. So latency is key here. And we'll come back to that a little bit. Uh, let's move forward. This is this is actually, these are two very important uh, concepts when it comes to trading order book and tick size. So if we start with the order book or central limit order book, I think the word central limit order book is like a legal term or something like that. I just talk about order books. So shares are traded in order books and an order book is you can view it as, as a list where we put the buy and the sell orders from many participants into this list. And we typically rank those orders in, in some way. And the way we rank it, and this goes for lit markets in general, we rank the orders after price. So the highest buy price is obviously highest in rank when it comes to someone wants to sell. So we will match the guy with the highest buy price first. And then on the same price level, if there are multiple orders on that price levels, multiple buy orders, we look generally on time. There might be some other tie breakers local on some exchanges. One we have one in, in, in the Nordics, but price time is, is 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 the most used, I would argue, when it comes to determining who will trade, actually. But the order books, I mean, we talked about shares. Shares is identified with something called ISIN. I actually don't remember what ISIN stands for, but it's like an identification number. For, for a Swiss share, it starts with SC, et cetera, et cetera. So the share actually can be traded in an order book provided by the primary exchange like Nasdaq Stockholm. But as Pierre mentioned, fragmentation of the MIFID 1. So the same instrument can actually be traded in an order book at Aquis or CBOE, the same in instrument. And uh, this is quite, quite important to understand that the market is fragmented. And you can trade the same instrument, the same commodity. It's fungible on different markets, and that is the competition. Uh, so far, primary markets have been quite successful in you know, maintaining the, the market share, as we saw, uh, generally. But it's fierce competition. It's about liquidity. It's about the order book quality in terms of spreads and the liquidity at, at the best prices, et cetera, that determines where traders typically trade. Tick sizes. Well, tick sizes talks about the smallest price change possible for a stock. And this is all governed by MIFID rule, MIFID two rules that we that came along 2018. So uh, in the MIFID rule, rules we have, and this is applied across Europe, EU, uh, depending on the price of the stock and liquidity, the number of trades generally, uh, we ha have, have different minimum uh, tick sizes ap applied. For example, if we have a stock traded at one euro, for example, maybe the tick size is one cent so you could increase your buy order price with one cent 
uh, in each step, for example. If, if it's a, a stock trade at 100 euros, perhaps the tick size is one euro. So it's 100, 101, et cetera, et cetera. This was just one example. But, but these are rules defined in regulation, nothing that the exchanges can, can, can influence at all. Uh, I think we talked about transparency, Pierre, that order books and the orders are pre-trade transparent, meaning that they are published as soon as the order comes into the, the book. We publish it directly, and I think we have a diagram later on that topic. Anything to add, Pierre? Yeah, of course, except for dark trading, where, as mentioned earlier, there is no pre-trade transparency since there is no order book visible, but there is always, always post-trade transparency, of course. Perfect. Thank, thanks a lot. This slide, uh, we're becoming increasingly more technical here. The matching engine, matching engine is, is, is essentially the heart of the trading system. And it could be like typically primary exchanges like Euronext, Nasdaq, and other platforms in Europe have their own software developed. Uh, smaller exchanges might have uh, bought in systems from third party suppliers, but this is, I would say, uh, technology that, that, that is like setting the comp competitive edge of the various pl platforms. I mean, if you have, and this circles back to latency, if you have a very effective matching engine with a very short round trip, meaning that I can get my orders in and accepted quickly by the matching engine, that is the competitive advantage. And I mean, if we look back, I would say 15, 20 years, matching engines had like latencies of that were counted in milliseconds. I mean, from the order was handed over to the to the trading system and that the order got accepted could take one, two, three, four, five milliseconds. Nowadays, we're counting microseconds. So we have this internal perspective, but the external perspective is, is also interesting. Pierre, you, you discussed, you know, data centers and, and investors situated in, in, in other countries, and especially if you have, for example, Nasdaq, we have the matching engine in Stockholm, but the competing markets are in 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 London, technically, in other European countries legally. But there's a distance, and the trading participants that we have are also participants on the MTFs, meaning that everyone is chasing latency to cut down that. And these actors that are into high frequency trading and low latency trading, they don't count milliseconds, they count microseconds, every single microsecond. And nowadays, I believe that most primary exchanges do relay, you know, timestamps down to nanosecond level. A nanosecond is extremely little. If microsecond was a millionth of a second, then uh, a nano is a billionth. If I count correctly here. It's it's amazing. Uh, anything else, Pierre, to mention on this slide? Uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's, full, uh, it's perfect. More more on the trading in infrastructure. So so trading front ends, connectivity, trading controls. Obviously, depending on what kind of investor you are, if you are a retail, you typically have a front end or you could have a web page provided by your internet broker. You see the prices, you see the trades, you see graphs, etc. Obviously, this is very user friendly, this user in interfaces, but it's not low latency trading, but it's, it's very handy. Those order instructions go to your broker, the broker sends the instruction to the exchange and your order is actually placed on the, on the primary market. Uh, when it comes to algo trading, uh, which <laughs> Pierre, you mentioned, has, has arisen a lot, those guys are not sitting with trading front-end or a GUI or user interface, uh, the web or something like that. They connect directly to the MTFs and primary markets via protocols or APIs to achieve the lowest latency available uh, for the purposes. 
so it's it's a, it's a mixture i mean not everyone is needs this these low latency connections but those guys that have trading strategies that are dependent on that like guys trading on both the primer and the mtfs and wanting to do arbitrage for example i mean if they are they cannot do that using the web right a web user interface they need to be hooked up in the data centers likely co-located meaning meaning that they have put their trading equipment close to the uh, matching engine to achieve the lowest available latency third thing on this slide is trading controls and that is actually governed by mifid 2 so the exchange as needs to have pre uh, trading controls i mean to check that orders are not too roughly priced or too big in order size, for example. Investment firms need to have the same and either the investment firm can have their controls or perhaps they can buy the exchange provided pre-trade controls. That differs a little bit. But all in all, trading controls are mandatory. And uh, I mean, price, price checks, volume checks, accumulated trading checks, I think uh, we can put together a list of like 30, 40 checks that are more or less common. Okay. You, you just chip in, Pierre, if you want to add stuff. Mm -hmm. So this presentation goes a little bit uh, very down to the details and a little bit high flying, and, and now we're a little bit high flying again. Uh, I think I mentioned that, I mean, you as a retail person, you're not directly connected to the exchange. You're not a member at the exchange. Who, who are the members to the exchange? Well, banks and brokers are members at the exchange. So they take in the orders, the instructions from the end users, could be retail, could be institutional. Retail guys could trade directly. I mean, they are interested in specific stock or they trade via like a fund uh, or ETF and the ETF. Those that manages that uh, send in, you know, orders to the respective exchanges to to handle the, the positions. So this picture tries to explain that the guys that are actually members at the exchanges are not the end investors it's more the banks and brokers. When it comes to market data, likely end users, investors and buy side are clients to, to, to various market data services of the exchanges, but that's a different story. Okay. Okay, uh, a little bit about MIFID 2 again, and uh, it's about, I mean, this is more, requirements on the investment firms by the way do you hear my dogs <laughs> in the background uh, they are quite quite nice uh, investment firms have the requirement to categorize their clients and, and in this slide three category categories are are, are 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 presented i just want to talk a little bit about client the client cl class retail client classification and i mean Retail clients are the guys that are the least least experienced to trade, and they need the highest protection. So that's why it's most important to protect the retail. I mean, the eligible counterparties or professional clients with you know tens of millions of euros in capital, we don't have to protect them as as much as the re the poor retails and. One example on how, on how retail clients are protected is that when, when you become a client to like an online broker, you need to answer a set of questions. And if you're interested to trade, for example, ET, ETPs, exchange traded products, you need to answer a set of questions. And if you fail, you, you cannot trade those products because you're not, you, don't have, you don't have the knowledge to trade them. So this is one super good example on, on, um, on um, on on uh, investor protection in in how it works in in practice okay and retail i mean uh, retail has surfaced on, on on many of these slides and i mean 
during COVID, at least we at, at Nasdaq and the Nordic saw a boost in retail interest to trade the markets. Maybe people were sitting uh, alone at home doing trading. We saw a giant interest in, 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 in trading. And uh, this group is actually extremely active, I believe, on all primary markets. And when these orders goes into the exchanges, these are genuine orders that actually make the market sound and active. I mean, these are real trading interest. It's not like an algo machine that's trying to do arbitrage. This is this is the food. <laughs> can I? I don't know if I can say that, but it's like the food for the market. I mean, the real tr trading interest. Maybe I expressed a little bit bad here, Pierre. <laughs> yeah. No, please continue. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would just 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 argue to say that retail an important part of the the, the clients trading on the primary markets. Uh, institutional investors, those guys, uh, banks, insurance companies, wealth managers. I mean, those are the more professional ones. Uh, I think we can. I think it's quite uh, self-explaining actually. Okay. Asset managers, uh, well, we're still in the area of, you know, professional clients or buy side. We have funds that gather a lot of capital. They can be open, they can be closed. However, these guys allocate a lot of capital and trade indirectly on the primary markets. Uh, ETFs, ETPs, I think will be covered later in this presentation today, so I wouldn't comment too much on that. But this, these are just examples on, especially the, the the funds that I think is quite interesting. And and one thing that I I was thinking of when preparing this, I mean, the ETF trading. I don't know how popular it is on, on other markets in Europe, but in the US it's quite popular. And I believe that the interest in ETFs are, are will grow in the future. What's actually quite popular in the Nordics are mutual funds, the open-ended funds. But the, the the downside with those guys, with those those kind of um, instruments, is that they are like you trade once a day. I mean, you, it's very hard to follow, you know, volatile markets compared to an ETF where you can go in and buy and sell directly on the exchange. So, yeah, I wouldn't say more on this slide. More co more concepts, ELPs, HFTs, banks and brokers. It maybe it's a little bit of repetition, but if we if we dive a little bit into the details uh, when it comes to electronic liquidity providers, ELPs, market makers, essentially I, I view these two names almost the same. ELPs, market makers, they provide liquidity to to the market, and. Uh, you could you could change the, the change the, the 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 order of the the words here. Make the market market makers. They make the market, and I mean this is extremely important, especially in less liquid stocks. You know where you know stocks that don't trade too often during the trading day. If there's a market maker there that always has a price, obviously spread is it's it's. Uh, it's selling higher than, than buying, obviously, and that is a spread. But there is always prices there, and that is quite beneficial for uh, small caps, micro caps that has suffering are suffering a little bit from 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 low liquidity. Liquidity is not an issue for the blue chip stocks or the index stocks, index stocks, but there. Uh, there's a fierce competition between the primary exchanges and the MTFs, and therefore many MTFs and, and primary markets do have various programs and essentially have incentives for, for market makers to uh, uh, higher the quality of the spread, uh, add liquidity at the best prices, have as, as small, uh, small spreads as possible, etc. So it's it's I, I would argue that it's more a, a rule that all exchanges have various kind of programs uh, creating a better market for everyone trading there. 
So they are quite important. High frequency traders, well, uh, obviously the market makers are high frequency because they need to be super, super, super fast. So uh, market makers are, are, are uh, a kind of high frequency trader. But here we can find like proprietary firms like that trade with own capital. They have algorithms, quite advanced, uh, low latency. Uh, they might find arbitrage possibilities, etc. So. Um, that that is that group and the, the last group i think we've uh, talked about that quite quite a lot the banks and brokers which acts as in intermediary between uh, the uh, retail and the buy side and the exchange because the banks and brokers are members at the exchange okay okay trading system we, we're circling back a little bit here on on, on on the details and i think the the next couple of slides will be quite detailed and busy but i think we will sort it out and uh, we have a matching engine in this case it's optic i believe it's pierre it's your matching engine but That's all cool. <laughs> all exchanges have like a matching engine that takes in the buy interest and sell interest and and we talked about those interests coming along as orders. So in this case, we have a buyer buy 80 at the price of 100 euros, seller 80 at the price of 100. And uh, those two orders obviously create a trade in this example. What happens then? Well, step one, it's very important that everyone gets to know about this trade. So this trade is pushed out publicly first and i believe that this is a principle among all primary exchanges in europe and then secondly you will get this trade back on the private line to the the members into the trade it's extremely important that everyone gets to know about this trade and obviously these the buyer and the seller gets to see this on the public feed as well the trade uh, goes to central clearing counterparties to CCP for clearing. And then uh, there's various, you know, regulatory reporting, but that's more uh, no obligation on both exchanges and, and trading participants. The market data uh, pushed out on public feeds is obviously picked up by various vendors like Bloomberg, Refinitiv, et cetera, and relayed back to the trading community in their front ends, et cetera. Um, market data. I mean, uh, I think we commented on the uh, on the transparency. Orders are pushed out in real time. So if this buy order comes in first, we'll publish that order. Everyone knows about it. And if the sell order comes in, we we publish the trade immediately. Uh, there's a little bit difference between various platform. In the Nordics, we have a, like a hybrid model. We, for some order books, we publish the counterparties of the trade. Um, for some some markets, uh, uh, for some segments, we do not do that. I think the general general setup in Europe is that it's just the trade. You don't see who's actually traded. Okay. Here we have some very nice uh, trading examples. Um, I think I mentioned this this word continuous trading. So uh, maybe we need to do a little bit short repetition. The trading day started with the opening auction. We set the first trading price. Then something called continuous trading is, is has started after that meaning that we continuously match buy and sell orders on a continuous basis. So in this case, we have an order book with the best price of um, uh, 100 on the, on the bid side, and the best price on the ask side is 102. Here, a market order comes in by 150 at market. This order comes in and trades the first the best order on the ask side, which is priced at 102. The quantity is 200, it's enough for 
the incoming buy order and we create the trade. This is a continuous trading trade standard. The second example <clears throat> is about auctions. And uh, here we have a mixture of <clears throat> orders. We have many bid, bid orders. We have many ask orders from many, many participants, which is the beauty of the closing auction. It's so deep, it's so many orders, and all exchanges have an algorithm seeking out the price where we can execute most shares. And this example, kindly provided by Euronext, we can almost by eyes see that the, the price has to be 102 euros because the buy order that is priced to 100 will not come in play because there are no ask orders or sell orders uh, more generous than 102. So we can see just by, by the eye that the equilibrium price or the uncrossed price will be 102. And the number of shares that we can trade is obviously, uh, we look at the, the bid side, it's 150 on that price level, and on the ask side is 200, then we can, we can trade 150 shares. This is this is this is very very uh, important concept that we 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 look at the price that can execute most shares. If we would have chosen any other price here available, less shares would have been traded or no shares. Okay. Order types. So the first the case here is about market orders, and here actually in this example. Your next and the Nasdaq market differ a little bit, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Pierre. But in this example, we have an incoming market order, 100 shares at market, and you trade through the best ask price. You trade trade 50 shares out of the 100 at price 102, and you trade 50 shares at pri price 100 and, 105. Yeah. Yeah, basically, if, if I can summarize a bit of things, and I think we are a bit short in time here. So, market people who are looking at us today, you need to see, you know, from the beginning, we, 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 we look at different ways to execute our orders across different venues, across different channels, from the lit, the dart, the auction, etc. And on top of that, you can basically add another layer, which is the order type. As Anders said, it could be a market order, meaning that you're you're going to eat the market, whatever the price is set already in the order book. You can set a limit of your order, could be on the buy or in the sell. But there is also something quite used that is the iceberg order, which is basically means to disclose to market participants always the top of your orders based on a very simple mathematical formula, usually the which is based on the average daily volume of uh, of uh, value traded, and basically once. Uh, 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 let's say a batch of uh, of trades has been done, then you move on to the other batch. And these are the most three ever used, I would say, order types that we can find uh, across uh, our key markets. Yeah, perfect. And I'm, I mean, on our markets, icebergs is like, could be as much as between five and 10% of our trading, quite used order types. I just wanted to say, market orders on Nasdaq, we just trade the, the top of book. We In this example, we, we, we would only trade the 50, 50 shares at price 102. Uh, last slide, uh, thanks for reminding about the time. I was so excited here, so I got lost of time. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Pierre. Uh, I think we can just comment on this. There's various liquidity type. We talked a lot about uh, market makers. They are important for index stocks, blue ships, for various reasons for primary markets, less liquid guys, ETPs, they are of extreme importance for primary exchanges. We mentioned our arbitrage guys, HFT, doing the primary and the MTF, want to be co-located, want to be fast, want to find price opportunities to sell, uh, sell uh, with a profit at another exchange, buy cheap and sell high at another exchange. That is like one arbitrage strategy. I think we need to stop here, Pierre. Yes, indeed. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, and uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Then I think it might be my turn. <laughs> 
Can everyone hear me properly? Yes, Shelley. Perfect. Sorry. No problem, no problem, just making sure. So thank you all for joining us today on uh, well, the equity markets, but also on market data. I hope everybody can see my screen at the moment. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about market data, what it actually means, uh, what how it sort of comes back in, in debate, what the industry looks like. And uh, if you have any questions during uh, this session, uh, feel free to raise your hand at any time. I'm happy to answer any questions in between. Or if uh, if I'm losing you, also let me know. Then uh, then also feel free uh, to give that one. Let's see. OK. Then I'm going to the first slide. So what's now really the role of market data in equity trading? I think it was mentioned already a bit, and I think uh, it can be quite clear market data is there for any trader or market participant to actually make informed decisions about what they trade. So they look at it. Is that all it is? No, it's also much more. Market data is not just used to make trading decisions. It's actually also used by many different types of businesses actually to build products upon. Um, so you can imagine uh, index providers who use equity market data to create their own indices and to sell those. Um, you can think about other trading platforms, alternative trading platforms such as systematic internalizers and multilateral trading platforms who use the, the, da the data to actually pack their or own platforms against it and therefore to compete also with them. Um, so it's, it's a very broad number of use cases, but I think in majority everybody knows it is, of course, informing trading decisions. So when we talk about market data, we talk about pre-trade and post-trade data, whereas the pre-trade data uh, is mainly the data that's there before actually a trade or has happened. So that's everyone that's telling the platform, I want to buy this volume of this product for this price, or I want to sell it for this volume for this price. That's all the data that Pierre and, uh, and Anders talked about. That's what we call pre-trade data. It's data that's actually available in our order books and it shows actually what's out there, what's available and for what price. Then the trade, the post-trade data is what we call actually after a trade has happened. So whenever two people in the order book meet each other and say, hey, I want to buy that for that price, for the same price that you're selling it, then you get a trade. Uh, and that's what we call post-trade data. That post-trade data tells us something about what has already happened on the market. So, so that's actually just what trades happened, for which price, which volume. So that's the two types of data uh, that we know in the equity business. And as they already explained, some platforms offer only post-trade data, meaning you can only see what has happened, but not what has happened before that. So, uh, and that are the dark platforms. And then you have the lit platforms where you can follow what's happening on there uh, at all times. So in terms of trading venues, what they do in basic is besides delivering trading, delivering market data, and they are not created separately. So often we refer to it as joint products, which is a very nice economic term. Uh, and actually what joint products means is actually very simple in economic terms. It means that the same systems, processes and activities that create the trade execution and price formation also create the market data. So that means we can't separate those activities. And that's what we call that joint product. So you can't create one without the other. Uh, but even more, uh, it are the same processes and systems that actually create both of them. I think that's it. Then in terms of what market data is, so when we refer to market data, there's sometimes a bit of confusion what we mean. When we refer to market data in a regulatory context, we mean the trading data. So the data that we're talking about pre and post trade data, but it's also often used to describe other types of data in the financial industry. And that's always a bit confusing. So, so that's always something to keep in mind when you talk about market data. There's much more than just the market data under, uh, under the regulation. So when we talk about trading market data, we talk about MIFIR and MIFID to regulate market data, but there are lots of providers in there that provide index data. So imagine uh, the performance of an index. They are calculated on a real-time basis. So you can actually see the values of an index growing. I mean, for most of you, the CAC 40, 
the AX, etc., are very familiar indices that you often see even on the news. Uh, and that's are the indices that you can create using equity data. And then it becomes a whole new data type. Uh, and alternative data, I mean, it goes as far. I once even heard that people used uh, satellite data in order to see how busy supermarkets were in order to project how well a supermarket was going to do in terms of stock price. So it can go very, very, very far. Uh, and it's very, very, very broad. Research is also a very important one. You can do research, you have kind of research data on companies. Um, we have corporate uh, corporate actions data where you have uh, data that tells you something about what a listed company is doing in terms of uh, paying out dividends, and whether they're going to have structural changes to their organization in terms of uh, entities. Uh, index weightings data, where you calculate the indices, uh, where you can see on what basis the indices are calculated. So it's really, really broad. And then even static reference data, just the data on a certain instrument. So it's quite broad and even news as well. So how is actually the market data sold in the industry? So the market data is actually sold through a value chain. So that means it's not just the market data providers and then the users of the data. In reality, there's many more parties involved in providing market data to customers and users. So what you will see when we refer to market data providers, we generally refer to stock exchanges, but also MTS and approved publication arrangements, so APAs. And the APAs in this case, they collect the information from OTC trading over the counter trading, so trading that doesn't happen on a trading venue. Uh, so that means that all the data is available to anyone. Uh, so you can have a direct feed to an exchange. You can go directly to an exchange and say, hey, I want your market data and you can buy that. And that's open for everyone. But you can also say, well, hey, I'm going to use a third party to access that data. And we refer to the third party as data vendors. And I think some uh, familiar names uh, in the industry are, for example, a Refinitiv, a Bloomberg, um, they collect all that data from different market data providers and they bring that together in their products. So they collect the data in groups and uh, do that. Then you can even have it even more complicated when we talk about a sub vendor in market data terms. And that's where actually there is another collector of the data behind another data vendor. So where one data vendor aggregates the data, the sub vendor might buy that aggregated data from a data vendor, so the data from multiple markets in some cases, uh, and then add additional statistics, research to it, and then sell it as a combined new package to their clients. So it's, it's a whole industry that's built on, on building products around the data and selling that. Uh, and then we have the brokers, a uh, very important role, of course, uh, both on our platforms as well as to the investor. Uh, they are someone that trades on behalf of another investor and they also provide those investors, their clients, with real-time market data. So that means that any retail client or just a professional asset manager that's behind the broker generally gets from the broker also the data for the markets they trade upon. So it's a very broad range of the type of people that can provide you with market data besides just exchanges. And what's now real, really the benefit of having a data vendor in the mix, the data vendors form a very important function. So what they do is they don't only necessarily aggregate the data from the different exchanges, but they also make sure that they normalize it. And what do we mean with normalizing? They make sure that you can actually read the data in one way, even though it might be ha have been delivered in several ways. So it's sort of make sure that you can interpret it quite easily. Uh, and also that your systems can. So you ha don't have to do that yourself. And also you don't have to connect to every single venue on your own. You just connect to one provider, the data vendor, and you don't have to go to every single platform. So that are the main benefits of taking the data via a data vendor. And then we have the end users, a huge variety you can already see. Uh, we have the higher frequency traders who generally use the data for the trading on their own account. Uh, they generally do so by having algorithms use the data. So that's actually where people use the data 
um, but not on the screen. They don't look at the data, but their computers have algorithms in there that use that data to determine what they're going to trade. We have indeed also the alternative trading platforms such as dark pools and systematic internalizers that use the data to run a competing platform. Uh, we have the brokers who use the data to, and to ensure that the orders of their clients go to the best price in the market. So they have generally the data from several exchanges uh, and other venues and they send it to the best possible place where the best price is available for their client at that point in time. The banks for their investment activities, market makers, uh, we have the fund managers and the asset managers who build portfolios of instruments. Um, and then we have the retail investor, not, not unimportant because the retail investor is very active in the European market. And researchers for research, uh, imagine looking at the data also in hindsight, seeing if you can identify certain trends in certain stocks, etc. So it can be very, very broad and also to assess, of course, performance of different markets. So that's the value chain. So what does that mean? So what type of market data do we make available? Well, when we sort of talk about market data, we distinguish between two things, uh, delayed data and real time market data. And when we talk about delayed data, we talk about the data that has been was been initially published 15 minutes ago. So that means you get the information 15 minutes after that you have actually that the, the trade actually occurred. Uh, and then we talk about real time data. That's everything that's faster than those 15 minutes. Uh, so that, that can be at any point uh, in time before those 15 minutes. So that's faster. Uh, and that can go into the milliseconds and nanoseconds. So in terms of delay data that's 15 minutes old, from a regulatory perspective, it's required to make that data available free of charge for all the venues. So that means that anyone who wants to have access to delay data can do so free of charge via either websites of, uh, of, of, uh, I say, of exchanges, but often also if you just type in Google and you go to Google and you type in an instrument on a certain stock exchange and you ask what's the price, uh, then you also generally get that price immediately. So that's also a way to access it. Uh, so that means that's already high quality data that's available in the market. And what you will also see is that retail investors in general have access to a lot of real time market data as well through their brokers. So that means that they will generally go through their broker and the brokers provide them with real time market data. For example, if you give an example for, for example, Euronext, there is more than 200 million investors, private retail investors. So retail clients that have access to real-time market data from the your next markets. Uh, so that's quite a lot, as you can imagine. So that means that real-time market data definitely also for the retail investor is important and widely available. In terms of that, we all, of course, know how important the market data is uh, in the industry. And also ESMA has seen that. They've also explained that they see an increase in the use of market data. Uh, that's, I think, widely observed. Uh, it has to do with the fact that more data is available, but also because more and more usage is driven by data. So that means that uh, more and more data is used to make decisions. Uh, also, we see a shift in how the data is used, where people used to always just view the data on the screen. More and more it happens that people, that systems use the data and interpret the data rather than people. So that's also something that we see a shift in usage in the industry. But still, if you compare market data to, for example, trading, and you can see that in the graph, then a majority of the costs for what will be retrieved still through the trading fees. So on average, you can see that for the, for the stock exchanges in Europe, most of them make still a majority of trading fees, which is the dark blue, and then the light blue, the market data fees. So that's a, a big majority still. And it's also remained quite stable, so it's a bit of a stable uh, statistic. It doesn't change a lot. Then we go to the consolidated tape, uh, a very actually recent debate, of course, with uh, the European Commission, who has uh, last week published its proposal for a European consolidated tape. Um, so why consolidated tape? Uh, in the end, uh, all the investors in the market, they need a good picture of what's happening in there. 
Uh, and there is currently an assessment that it could be better, let's say that way. So we do have data vendors who do provide consolidated data to clients. Uh, but that's mostly what we see in practice. That's mostly the data of what's happening on the stock exchanges and MTFs, so the lit market. That's mainly because that's data that's of quite high quality. So it's quite easy for a data vendor to actually aggregate it, normalize it, and also give to their clients. Uh, with regards to OTC, so over-the-counter and systematic internalizer data, it's still hard to use. So it's still, in terms of quality, still lacking. Um, and that is where, where there are definitely improvements that need to be made in order to make it easier to consolidate that also for a full picture of what's happening in the market. Um, so, and the reason why that picture is more difficult to complete is because after MIFID 1, which introduced more competition, there was also more fragmentation because there were more platforms. So that means that in order to aggregate that all, that became, of course, much more of a challenge. So in terms of then what did MIFID 2 do? So originally MIFID 2 already introduced a consolidated tape. Um, that means that it said, well, it needs to cover post-trade data from all venues. However, no commercial offering for consolidated tape emerged. So we're now a couple of years further. There is no consolidated tape. And one of the, one of the reasons was that structural challenge to actually aggregate all the data uh, while the data quality was bad. Uh, and that's, I think, something that definitely needed to be addressed. And that's what you will also read back in, in the proposals of the European Commission, where the European Commission is actually looking to improve uh, the way the data is delivered uh, so that it will be easier to aggregate. And then, and also will derive more value of it. Then also, what kind of tape can do that? So in a cost effective way, because that's of course also important. We have already quite a lot of aggregators in the market in the form of data vendors. So it's important that whatever the consolidated tape will be, that it will of course add additional value to the capital markets. Uh, and what will you see? And the most critical issues are then solving the low quality of data. And that's a widely, uh, I say, a widely agreed upon challenge. Uh, I think almost every market participant agrees that that needs to be improved. Uh, and then also one thing to consider when you build a CT is the latency. Uh, what we always see is and latency is the speed with which you see the data. And it, latency already occurs when you have to travel some geographical distance. So that means that the bigger the distance is, the more latency you will have. So you will actually see the data less soon. Uh, and especially with the consolidated tape, that's something to take into account because if all the data has to go to a consolidated tape and then goes to the users, um, then it has to travel distance two times. And then also pending, depending on the location of the CT, uh, different users in different countries will receive that data at different times, so with a different delay. So these are all concerns to take, or all reasons to take into account when you build a consolidated tape, and, and that was also probably one of the main challenges uh, of the European Commission. And then you come also back to the different type of consolidated tape options. In terms of the consolidated tape, we, we look at sort of the design criteria. So in terms of coverage, what should be included in that tape? What data should be included, what not? Uh, and what you see back now currently in the, in the proposal from the European Commission is that it should include uh, all asset classes, uh, then also all the markets, so all the venues that also over the counter, also systematic internalizer, everything has to be included. Uh, and then in terms of the speed, they have now opted for a real-time tape. And then real-time in this case means close to real-time. So that means as close to real-time as possible. Uh, and then also you have, of course, a depth of book. And when we talk about depth of book, it's similar as when we talk to about post-trade and pre-trade, whereby uh, post-trade data tells us something about what's happened and the pre-trade data tells something about what's available, and then depth of book refers to actually the depth of the pre-trade data. So do you see the best bit and offer of the market, or do you see everything that's happening in the market? Uh, then 
GCT options also have options in terms of what we currently are discussing and what you see in the industry uh, is that there have been discussions about a post-trade end of day tape, meaning a tape that actually shows what has happened on the markets for the full day at the end of the day. Uh, this is particularly beneficial if you, for example, want to see at the end of the day whether whether your broker indeed centers had sent your trades to the best venue or the cheapest venue or at the right price at the cheapest price. Uh, we can talk about a post trade tape with 15 minutes delay. Um, so that means the 15 minute delay data, which is also uh, available free of charge. But then for all the markets together. Uh, that's also particularly useful and also relatively these two options, the option three and four are also relatively cost effective to achieve. Uh, and then you have, of course, also the post trade tape close to real time. Uh, close to real time means much less than the 15 minutes. So it means that, that we're talking about maybe seconds. Uh, then we have indeed there a post trade tape in real time, which was uh, is currently the proposal of the European Commission that was published last week, at least initially for the initial phase. And then we have what we call a pre trade tape. That's also part of the discussion uh, in that field. And that is actually a tape that would also contain everything that's going on at the market at this moment in time. So what we call the BPO, uh, BPO debt, best of book, best bit and offer. So it means that you see also the best bit and offer in the market available at any time. When you talk about the difficulties of that, uh, just if you sort of want to know what the structure of a tape is, why it's also quite difficult and also more expensive generally to have a real-time tape versus a delay tape, uh, is mainly the fact that when you want to have a full view of the market, we're talking about more than, definitely more than already 300 venues, trading venues, plus SIs. So we're talking about a huge number of sources that, that Consolidated Tape will have to get the data from. That's already challenge number one, the, the getting a full view of the market. Then the second challenge for Consolidated Tape is data harmonization. This is something you will also read back in the proposals of the European Commission. Uh, data harmonization uh, is really about, OK, how are you going to make sure that all the data from all those different sources uh, can be interpreted in the same way by the person who will receive it in the end, the market data user. So you have to harmonize the data from different sources. And that requires, in order to do that, also requires high quality data. Because if the quality is bad, it's difficult, more difficult to harmonize it. Then you're going to standardize the trade mes message. So you're going to make sure that you're also going to produce it in, a, in one single format so that the receiver can also receive it in a single format. Uh, and then it goes to the end user. And you can do a lot of different things with a consolidated tape. Uh, they're not new things. So these are things that are currently already happening in the market. Um, but you have to think about, for example, you can do trade analysis, make investment decisions on it, portfolio monitoring, risk management, compliance monitoring. So there's a lot of use cases that you can mention for a, a tape in general, a consolidated tape. And generally, the, if we talk about delivery mechanisms, there are different things that you can think about. Uh, and I think one of the common ones discussed are cloud solutions, APIs. Uh, I say sometimes in some cases you might want to consider whether there should be a visual component to it. So that means that you already have the data in a format that you can already visualize it, even when you receive it immediately, without having to do that uh, by yourself. So there's different ways of delivering also a consolidated tape. So I think that's the main challenge of deconsolidated tape. I don't know if there's any questions on the consolidated tape or market data. And if not any, then I think I'm going to hand it over. OK, very Why? conscious of time, I will use uh, my uh, short time, uh, shortest time to, to, to introduce you to the ETFs uh, uh, instrument, ETF space. The strange thing is that uh, usually uh, presenting ETFs, uh, we will talk a lot about indices. <laughs> that is, they, seems uh, counterintuitive. 
but uh, uh, is uh, okay can we go to okay thank you very much uh, but it's easier this way trust me uh, everyone knows uh, more or less what uh, an index is uh, index uh, uh, indexes are uh, a theoretical representation of a market uh, a sector uh, an asset class uh, an investment idea and uh, uh, here you may see some different uh, way to build indices, uh, the uh, index industry has uh, developed uh, a lot uh, and uh, together with uh, very traditional indices, you may find a lot of other uh, customized index or index uh, of second, third generation. Um, why are we interested in indices? Because indices are um, something that is theoretical is uh, fascinating they are great uh, great representation of an asset class we would like to invest in but uh, they are not uh, directly investable for this reason uh, instrument financial instruments are needed to invest in index and of course uh, today we we will have a focus on the etfs what ETFs are? Uh, they are funds. So ETFs is the acronym of uh, Exchange Traded Funds. And uh, uh, they are funds. So the F is very important. That are exchange traded. Sarah, may I ask you to go to the next slide? Sorry. Okay. Is, so we are talking about a a, a real fund from a regulatory and uh, I can I say, um, uh, yeah, from a regulatory point of view, this is a fund, a fund that is exchange traded. So uh, the, the, the main difference, difference, the only difference from a traditional fund is that uh, the ETFs is exchange traded. And going back to what has been said at the very beginning, this depends on the fact that uh, there is uh, these uh, shares are dematerialized. So what happened at the very beginning with the, uh, equity uh, 40 years ago, something like that, it depends on the country, happens also in the funds in this space of the ETFs. So uh, ETFs are funds, as we were saying, they are uh, issued under the uh, regulation that uh, the, is, uh, is uh, the, the fund regulation in Europe is called the USITS, the, the USITS regulation. So these funds are, can I say, harmonized and they have, of course, uh, lots of requirements they have to fulfill uh, in order to uh, protect investors. The, the, the aim is always the same. One of these characteristics is to have a portfolio that is well diversified in order to minimize the risk. ETFs, since they are funds, they have the same requirement to, to fulfill. Uh, the other uh, protection that are uh, set to, to protect investors are that uh, the uh, capital, so the, the money raised by a fund, are uh, not attackable by uh, creditors that are different from the note holder. And also in this case, uh, the money raised can be invested and can be only uh, given back to the people that uh, have uh, both that kind of uh, funds. On the other side, exchange traded fund, they can they uh, they can have all the positive uh, features that stocks has have. Uh, the mainly the, the possibility to be uh, traded in market, so in electronic market, during the the, the old days, so when the the market they when they are opened, they can participate at uh, auction also, closing auction, opening auction. I'm very fond of closing auction as well, and uh, they can be borrowed. They you can short ETFs. You can do everything you are accustomed already to do with the, with the stocks. So the, the very important things about ETFs is that from a, from a very regulated point of view, they are funds. They are not like funds, they are funds. But from a market point of view, they are traded as, as shares. If we can go 
to the next slide. Here, a, a recap that uh, highlights some other uh, features that, uh, for instance, funds have and ETF have a, a, as well. The fact that uh, the mutual funds can be created and redeemed. So the, the way you trade the mutual funds is uh, that uh, you buy or sell them uh, through this mechanism of creation and redemption. So you ask for a creation of a, a, a unit or you ask for a redemption of a unit. Uh, this is done directly with the mutual funds uh, or uh, the transfer agent or this kind of uh, funds agents, agent. And uh, is, uh, uh, also the settlement is according to what is uh, prescribed, uh, written in the prospectus. With the stocks, as we were saying, you can buy and, and sell them on the market and the settlement is uh, T plus true, two, all over <laughs> now. Uh, with ETFs, uh, you have the two mechanisms that uh, uh, are in place uh, in the same moment. The intraday uh, trading is what we call the, in the secondary market, happens in the secondary market, uh, while what we call the primary market is where the units of ETFs can be created or redeemed. If we can go, sorry, to the next slide. Okay, maybe the next slide as well, so we can, okay, it's, it's easier this way. Uh, let's focus on the yellow part that is easier, just to let, to, 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 to have very clear that there is a primary market and a secondary market. These two markets are linked, linked together uh, by this, uh, uh, this uh, company that uh, act as uh, authorized participant on the primary market and as a market maker on the secondary market. They are traditionally, they are uh, brokers. And what they do on the primary market is to ask the fund company to create or redeem units. On the secondary market, they trade the units that they have created or, redeem, or they can buy the, the units that they want to redeem. This mechanism, I don't want really to, to lose too much time, but trust me, and is very well explained uh, in, in, the, in, every, in the internet, as we see. Uh, the, this link is what uh, uh, make possible uh, that uh, you don't have any, I can say, pressure on the sell side or the buy side. And for this reason, the, uh, fair, the price of the market is always uh, the price of the portfolio that is in the uh, fund, in the ETF. And if it's not the case, this uh, subject, the market maker authorized participant, can buy in the market and redeem uh, with the fund company or vice versa. Uh, th through this mechanism, the two markets, the two value of the, uh, the, of the fund are aligned. If I may... So, Sarah, thank you very much. How big is the uh, ETF phenomenon uh, in, in, the, in, wor in the world and uh, in Europe? This uh, uh, slide is for Europe, uh, for uh, what uh, is related to the global uh, ETF phenomenon. The two weeks ago, uh, the ETF AUM, so the asset under management that is invested in ETFs in the world, has reached the 10 trillion uh, US dollars. 6.5 billion are trillions, sorry, it's too big to be said. Uh, 6.5 trillion are, uh, represents the US A market. Here, Europe, as you may see, is around 1.5 trillion. The very interesting thing is that, of course, this industry is increasing, is growing, is evident, but uh, the, the, the most important part is that it has grown a lot, and this year is growing, is, is, is crazy how it's going, uh, during the pandemic period. 
what happened uh, it was like a live stress test last year in march and april when the market uh, got crazy uh, the uh, etfs uh, had the, the the possibility to to prove that they just do what they are supposed to do nothing more nothing less they just uh, mirror and they uh, track the value of the underlying and that's what happened uh, during the this uh, can say tor tormented uh, uh, period in the markets and what happened was that uh, everyone that wanted to buy or sell uh, add prices uh, on the markets so the markets uh, regulated market uh, uh, especially they granted the possibility the liquidity uh, of these uh, instruments because uh, uh, they, there are obligations that are imposed on the liquidity providers that act on the, act on the markets. And uh, uh, the prices were uh, reflecting the, the real price of the, of the underlying. Also, Yosco has uh, uh, that uh, usually was a bit uh, sceptical uh, on, on ETFs. Uh, they have written a press release in August uh, telling uh, to the all the industry that uh, ETFs has proven to has proven to be resilient and to guarantee this price uh, uh, discovery that is very important uh, for the market. So I believe now that uh, this this year is uh, uh, can I say uh, reflecting uh, this uh, good uh, good. Uh, feedback uh, the, the, this uh, instrument had uh, last last year if uh, Sarah thank you uh, very very briefly uh, Europe as I was saying is a bit uh, delay uh, versus the, the the US market both because uh, the, the first uh, listing uh, here in, uh, in Europe uh, happened uh, in uh, 2000, uh, while uh, it was already there for a couple of decades uh, in the uh, uh, US. The other thing is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, different countries in Europe have different approach, uh, but uh, some country that has uh, this problem with uh, rebate uh, that are, can be granted uh, to the distributed uh, uh, product uh, that is uh, can I say slowing the the I'm gonna say the, the growth of the of the ETF market in the the uh, MIFI 2 the this instrument has been uh, so ETFs uh, were included they are as I was saying they are funds but they are uh, treated as uh, equity like so you may find them in the rts2 uh, one sorry for instance uh, for the um, uh, transparency regime and uh, one thing is that i want to say but we have really no time to to cover this part uh, is that uh, to, to to put uh, attention on what is called etfs uh, with the f uh, that is a fund as we were saying, and what uh, doesn't have a fund in, in the F, but as a same, something else. So uh, you will see that ETC, or so exchange traded commodities, or exchange traded notes, uh, also in the MIFID are uh, are different. They are different. They are not fund. They are very similar, and they mirror some behavior. Uh, the, the better behavior, the behavior of the ETFs, but they are not fund. So, for instance, they are not required to have a portfolio that is diversified. So, it's very useful if you want, for instance, to have an instrument that uh, track the gold. For instance, in this case, you will have an ETC, not an ETF, or at least not an ETF under the European regulation that is the usage. And uh, um, in the MIFI 2, uh, these uh, ETC ETNs are in the RTS uh, to uh, like uh, bond like uh, instruments. I think uh, I can close here because it's really very, very late. Okay, then that's my cue, I think.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Daphne van der Stam. Um, I'll keep it short. Um, Sarah, would you mind going to the next page? It might be easier that way. Thank you so much. So, um, how is equity regulated? Uh, it, uh, I'm starting with a bit of a history le lesson, if you'll bear with me. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to have lived through it. But um, uh, so <laughs> I'm hoping I can fly you through this. Um, equity products, the trading environment, as well as the product itself, are regulated mainly by European regulations. Um, we have the MIFID regulation, which covers the trading environment for products, uh, the trading environment of regulated markets and all other platforms, the way brokers interact with investors who want to trade on markets. Um, how market data is uh, offered uh, and how uh, uh, certain post-trade aspects are dealt with. Then the product itself is also regulated um, by way of the prospectus regulation uh, requiring an, an information document to be published if and when, for instance, a company wants to go public and access capital. And there is a transparency directive, probably all very familiar to you, which requires a company to continuously disclose information, for instance, financial information, yearly and uh, semi-annual reports. Um, the last one, uh, which is mentioned here, is market abuse. Obviously, price sensitive information, the way uh, the management board of a company deals with uh, sensitive information in a company, um, uh, reporting of positions and so on and so on. So there's, there's a lot around uh, the issuance of equity that offers to provide safeguards to investors when trying to when wanting to invest in a company. Let's do the next slides. Back in history, like I said, um, back in 2004, the first MIFID uh, uh, directive uh, was entered into force. Entered into force, um, and it it aimed mainly uh, to increase competition. Back then. Um, equity was traded mainly on exchanges. Um, that was a natural uh, uh, evolution because exchanges have been around for over 400 years. I, uh, the, the oldest exchange actually uh, uh, originated in Amsterdam back in 1604. Um, I'm based in Amsterdam, so I, I know my history facts. <laughs> and these exchanges have evolved over uh, hundreds of years into what they are these days. The policymakers felt that there needed to be more competition because in essence, every country had one exchange. Like one of our previous CEOs always said, every country needs a flag, an army and an exchange. And it's, it's, it's quite true. So since 2004, um, uh, with the MIFID directive, it opened up competition. Um, and it allowed for new platforms, multilateral trading platforms to arise, which could offer trading in equity. Uh, uh, MPS would tra offer trading in equity, the same equity that is already listed with the exchanges. I'll come back to that. Other elements uh, uh, introduced by MIFID were uh, passporting, which allows companies, brokers to offer services across the board. So in the whole of Europe, which was really a good a step in a good direction. Uh, rules around pre and post trade transparency. You heard Anders and Pierre speak about the system that we have today, the way you can access uh, uh, markets. You heard Shelley ex explain how data is organized. That all started uh, back in 2004. Best execution rules were first introduced. It, it seems odd that it was that late in time, but before that, it, it wasn't really cut out in regulation. So an investor needs to receive best execution, which means it needs to be executed, his order, at a certain, uh, at the best cost speed and other uh, some other specifications that are in the regulation. And that is a, an obligation that lies with the investment firm. Um, also, it allowed for the uh, uh, for the concept of a systematic internalizer and broker crossing networks, which cover trading in the dark. And I'll get to that in a minute. So sorry, the next slide, please. And if I'm going too fast or if anyone has any questions, please do stop me. Um, Sarah, could we do the next? Oh, you have the next slide. Sorry, um, I explained this already. So let's skip to the next one. Consequences of MIFID one. Yes, so the policymakers indeed got what they asked for. 
um, with the rise of MTFs, uh, systematic internalizers, and other types of uh, platforms, a lot of fragmentation occurred. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing because what competition does, it drives the cost down and it makes uh, trading more accessible to investors and at certain points also cheaper. What it also does, it uh, offers trading in equities on different types of platforms so that you can choose where you would like to execute your order. And uh, because of the fact that shares are fungible, they are the same exact product, no matter where you trade it, it is possible to do so. So if you want to invest in a company and you want to buy a share in whatever company you want to call Total, um, it doesn't matter whether you purchase it on an MTF or on the exchange where the company originally listed, it is still the same product. So um, that happened, a lot of competition. Uh, because of cost developments, you could also see a development in the broker concentration. Um, smaller brokers uh, uh, had difficulty catching up with the new environment. They consolidated into larger brokers. brokers and uh, new services were developed as a result of best execution rules and transparency rules. As you can see, uh, uh, transaction cost analysis, which catered to the best execution, which also catered to the discussion is, are, am I getting my money's worth as an investor? Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Where are we now? Um, MIFID two. So we're now in 2008. The financial crisis starts, banks start falling over, um, uh, people are panicking, and the regulators uh, feel that they need to step up their game and uh, regulate the financial markets more strict in order to provide safety and stability to the markets. The G20 agreement was, of course, a big element to that. The G20 agreement uh, 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 between countries stated that uh, mainly OTC derivatives, and it's a sidestep, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for now, but OTC derivatives needed to be uh, uh, traded in a more safe manner, which means uh, uh, the introduction of a clearing obligation and also the introduction of a trading obligation for certain derivatives in order to provide a more safe environment so that investors, if a bank goes belly up, investors could still have access uh, uh, to their products or could still sell their products if they wanted to. Um, so that was a big topic of the discussions on MIFID II. Um, another discussion was as a result of the development of MIFID I, lots of competition happened, lots of trading platforms originated, not all of them were equally transparent. Exchanges, as you've just learned, offer pre and post trade transparency, uh, uh, order books in which uh, there is a non-discretionary objective matching of orders according to price, time and, and other rules. Some platforms didn't offer that possibility. So the broker crossing networks, the systematic internalizers basically uh, took client uh, orders and matched them off venue in the dark without transparency with the rationale being we're being more efficient this way because we don't have to go through all of the platforms, pay for all of the execution costs, or we might as well do it ourselves because we sometimes have two sides of the book in our own uh, 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 in our own institution. So we're we could do it easier this way. That being said, that is a valid argument, but the result was that over 40% of trading in Europe was done in the dark. That also means that ex investors have less access to pre-trade transparency and you can no longer see what the value is of that share. You can see it for 60%, but not for the other 40%. So that was a big no-no. Policymakers tried to improve that by introducing new rules in MIFID II. Let's do the next slide. These are the rules that were introduced. Um, a clear policy goal to get trading on transparent venues as much as possible, as much as suitable. There are, of course, different types of trades. When we're talking about small trades, veto investor trades, or just uh, uh, institutional investor trades in smaller amounts, uh, uh, they should and can contribute to transparency. 
the big concern during the MIFID negotiation was, of course, larger institutions that have blocks to trade. They feel they shouldn't expose these lo uh, large blocks to pre-trade transparency because it also exposes them to risks. So there are certain ex ex exemptions to pre-trade transparency. Those rules were introduced here, um, but with a limitation. So a large and scale waiver, for instance, is a, 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 an allowance to trade a larger order in the dark. In addition to that, we have the so-called uh, refer we have the so-called reference price waiver in MIFID II, which basically says, look, if on the market there is an, a, a mid price, and you can offer that mid price to your retail investor or to your investor, you're welcome to trade in the dark on that reference price because you will probably provide your investor with the same safeguards. However, a cap was introduced, a double volume cap to that, to ensure that not all trades <laughs> will go to the dark and nothing would be left to the light. Um, in addition to that, and that was also part of the whole financial crisis and we want more transparency, a share trading obligation was introduced, which uh, stated that every share that is already admitted to listing on a venue or to trading on a regulated market should really also be traded on a trading venue. And we, you've seen that there are different types of trading venues. You have uh, regulated markets, multilateral trading facilities or OTFs, and then you have systematic internalizers who are also subject to a number of rules. So clearly the policymakers try to arrange for a, uh, for a framework that allow transparent trading as much as possible and uh, a certain limited amount of dark trading. And I'll skip the tick size harmonization, but that's also a part of the safeguard in order to ensure that the, the, the right information for the right type of order is available. Let's do the next slide. If I'm going too fast, someone stop me, but I'm trying to keep in the time limits. Um, so what happened after MIFID II? The goal was we want more trading on transparent markets. We want less OTC and dark volume. Um, really didn't happen. After MIFID II, we've actually seen more and more platforms or regulated venues arising. Lots of activity moved from broker crosser ne crossing networks to uh, uh, the, or stayed within systematic internalizers. And we saw trading uh, participants uh, also register themselves as an SI, which allowed them to also trade in the dark. Um, that is a concerning element, and that is also part of the, the, the MIFIR proposal, which is, which is now published. Although when I say part, I'm probably giving it more credit uh, than it deserves, but let's not go there. Um, it, it, it's still a concern. If, if you are familiar with the ESMA statistical reports, the one that was published for last year, uh, basically stated then that almost 50% of trading is still done in the dark. So it's it's definitely something that is worth looking at. In addition, uh, post MIFID II, um, as Shelley was able to, to explain, there was an explosion of data, market data, um, all with the aim to increase uh, transparency, allow for best execution, and also to allow the regulators to uh, to to regulate to see what is happening. So it's it it introduced data reporting. Uh, uh, databases were uh, de designed with regulators for trading venues to report into, and this way uh, uh, a, a, a common overview of the markets and its functioning could be undertaken. So that's that's a big positive. Um, a side effect of MIFID was uh, uh, research. Um, as you know, uh, a company is only as visible as the publications it gets. Research analysts are very important for companies. Um, if they are followed by analysts, the more they get, the more visibility they get, the more interest they also get from institutional investors globally. The MIFID rules uh, uh, basically said induce, uh, introduced a, a sort of a ban on inducement. It was subject to member states interpretation of that. But it, uh, it basically disintermediated research, which uh, uh, led to an increase in costs of research and a decline in research. And that particularly mattered for the small and medium sized companies, the ones that we really want to access capital and growth. 
because analysts felt it too costly to follow them. That was now addressed a year ago by the Mifid Quick Fix, and we're hoping to see an uptick in that. But it was a, it, it was a, 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 an unintended side effect, let's put it that way, from Mifid 2. Um, let's do the next slide. This is what I briefly spoke about. This is, this is a table you can see the different types of trading occurring after MIFID II. Um, and as you can see in the, in the dark, in the blue at below is the, 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 the order book trading, so the transparent, and all the other colors are different types of trading, which are semi-transparent or even dark. It is, uh, I can say with certainty, not what was intended by the policymakers. Although dark trading is legitimate in in, in certain uh, instances, but you can well you can you can read the picture for yourself and draw your own conclusions. So we're now at MIFID two and a half. Let's put it that way, and we will be eager to see what comes out of that discussion. Six o'clock exactly. That leaves almost no room for for questions. But if there are questions, please do ask them. Thank you, Daphne. If there are no questions uh, now, but you have any remarks uh, afterwards, uh, because we are uh, conscious of the uh, of the fact that we run uh, slightly late, please uh, don't hesitate then to contact the uh, FESE Secretariat, and we will be happy to to send you further uh, um, contact if needed. So uh, thank you again to all uh, the participants uh, to this first uh, phase of webinar and in particular as well to our speaker for joining us today. As mentioned at the beginning, we will share the slide via email after um, the, the end of the, of the webinar. Uh, let me take this opportunity to mention again uh, our second webinar on derivatives and CCPs, which will take place at the same time next Thursday. If you are interested, please contact us and we will send you further details. So unless there are any other comments and have a very good evening. Thank you for participating and goodbye.